started talking about it, and the dialogue was to the effect of, well, it's fine knowing about these pitfalls, but how do we avoid them? And, and, and that really gave us pause. You know, like, how can we transfer that knowledge to this? Because we would say, oh, you know they're there, so plan to not go there, or you've got experience. sense of what it was that, that they were doing, not that we don't talk, you know, step in it ourselves every once in a while, right, but um, with the experience that we have, we have experience of avoiding them. So we tried to distill what it was that helped us avoid them, and that's how we got this session. So, for those of you that are interested, um, do a Google search or remember this really long Here's a shortcut, okay? These are some of the things that, that we felt were the most common. Yeah. <laughs> These are the things that we, we felt were most common, and it's not like, well, they're the most common for us, because we've been doing it for 100 years, but for clients who are either new to Drupal or trying to get the most out of Drupal, these were some real challenges. You know, multi-sites, there's a, a terrific uh, pull for multi-sites, for efficiencies and lots of different reasons. And discovery is so easy to skip because subject matter experts know their subject so well, right? So, um, but this is not uh, so much ab about the, the pitfalls as how to avoid them. Because what we were able to do is put together a list, but we really can't anticipate when you are going to encounter these. Handy dandy road signs are difficult to come by. And you know, we talked about these pitfalls specifically because of their inexorable quality, right? They have a way of sneaking up on us. Constraints prevent us from steering clear of them. Time, scope, budget uh, sometimes force us in our projects to take risks. Um, and pull us in closer than we really are comfortable uh, with, with being. Uh, so what do we do? Um, what we figured out through our conversations with one another and uh, our staff is that uh, we needed and we usually employed early warning systems in our projects and that uh, it it, it, our practice that had evolved over time. Early warning systems come in different shapes and sizes, but they are systems. Now, neither, none of us have the luxury of having a fully functional character programmed in multiple technologies, as data was but he was still an early warning system and he had certain sensitivities. His character uh, was written to have certain sensitivities that the next generation could rely upon to ward them away from danger before it got too catastrophic. Well, we don't have data. But we do have early warning systems. We've had them for a long time. Miners used to bring canaries into the coal mines to warn them of dangerous gases, right? So the concept of an early warning system is one that we're very fam familiar with.
Yeah. So, and we can't really bring a canary onto a, a Drupal project. And it might be very sweet, um, but they wouldn't be a very good early warning system, right? And we don't have this guy as much as we'd like him, right? So what do we have? What's a com more common uh, analogy or metaphor for an early warning system? Ever notice how your crash test dummies on television are always the most talkative, right? And of course, they're getting banged around. And the purpose of a, cross, a crash test dummy is really to prevent worse injuries. It's the concept of harm reduction. They are a type of early warning system. And they ask lots of questions. They're very talkative. So where we're going with this is a concept of early warning systems or personas. And this is not something that I think is really very intuitive for us on our teams. You know, we want to have folks that ask lots of questions in front of the client. Asking lots of questions, that gets a little scary sometimes because we're supposed to be the folks that know the answers, right? And if you're a client and you have a vendor that asks a lot of questions, you might say, well, why are they asking so many questions? Aren't they the ones that are supposed to know the answers? Personas will be different people at different times during different phases of your project. Uh, so during your discovery, it might be a developer, it might be a designer that's bringing up concerns. Um, but you don't want to ignore them because those questions that you ignore are going to be, chances are, things that come up later on that are going to bite you. Right? So if you're, you know, if you're having a conversation with a client and they're telling you about a migration they have to do and you just have to move this data over and the developer is looking at something and saying, well, what is that thing? concerns that even a low-level person in a project meeting would bring up. Maybe there's a content editor that's saying something. And other people in the room are like, oh, who cares? That's just so-and-so who just, you know, the marketing intern that just sent this data. Like, don't worry about that. Well, maybe they're pointing out something related to the workflow and the things that they actually do to commit the content, and it's something that you <coughs> might want to address, and you might just be in a feature or it's going to change, slight change the architecture and how you perform your workflow, or it's just giving you maybe a problem that that person knows about that you might want to dive into deeper, right? But if they're asking these questions and they're pointing out these different things, don't ignore that stuff, right? Don't assume people ask stupid questions. I would say if somebody's asking a stupid question, then you should be able to answer it. And sometimes there's, a, there's essentially a line of inquiry that may resemble one thing at the beginning upon the first question and then may evolve into something else a few questions later. And if you shut that process down at the beginning, you don't get to realize the potential value of those questions. Implicit in this equation is that you have some system, some persona, some processes asking, and some system, some process some persona listening. 
and analyzing and thinking these things through. And we, de we developed this particularly because we didn't, want to, we didn't want to put anyone in a position of, we, we wanted to develop something authentic, right? So we have in our projects the limitations, the famous iron triangle of time, scope, and budget. It, it wouldn't be fair to come and present a solution that involved you moving any one of those three points. Your limitations are what they are, right? The only time any one of those can move is when there's a real authentic reason. So we had to develop a, a, you know, a, a way of avoiding these pitfalls that could function within right, your time, your budget, and your scope requirements. And really wh what we came to after talking to enough folks was that this is something that had to become a habit within our teams. And each member of the team had to internalize it and support it and embrace. And we, we developed this. And then the first time we gave this session uh, was at the uh, Drupal Camp New Jersey uh, at the beginning of the year. And we had uh, one of our most awesome um, staff members, Maria Stoyanova, uh, who's a program uh, director um, at FFW and used to be a project manager. And we gave the presentation and she came up to us afterwards and she says, I'm the crash test dummy. Because she recognized it immediately. Because she, Maria is famous for always asking questions and always zeroing in on things. So what we thought we would do is go through each of these pitfalls and sort of have like a call and response. What you might, might listen for and some questions that you might ask. And what we thought we'd do is we'd run through the list really quickly and then time permitting, uh, go back and have some kind of discussion. We're a big group, but I think we can still have a discussion about how you might approach these different pitfalls. So the idea is to develop sensitivities to the pitfalls that we listed at the beginning of this session. And then furthering that, if you buy into this idea of an early warning system, what you want to do is you want to develop your own list of pitfalls. Maybe you'll have some in common. Maybe you'll have some that are special for your service organization or for your, uh, uh, your, your university, your enterprise, your small business. Okay? And they'll be, you'll have a particular set of pitfalls based upon your strengths and your weaknesses. So the idea is to take this concept, internalize it, customize it, and make it resonate and be relevant for, for everyone. So you're ready to go through each of the 10 pitfalls? Put our crash test dummy and our canary to work? Mistake number one, planning without performing a thorough discovery. Who's never done that? <laughs> right. It's easy. Skipping discovery is really bad. Okay, and, and really easy because you know, you're working all the time with folks that know your stuff. They know their stuff, that's what they do all the time. But we forget things, we lose track of things. There are things that different stakeholders care about that others care less about. So never, ever, ever skip discovery. And your clients, they, they tend to know their system. And so everybody knows that discovery is so important. So everybody in this room is going to have a discovery in the next project. Fine, right? But you know you're headed for a pitfall if, when in the middle of that discovery, someone asks, where is so-and-so? Shouldn't they be here? And then, of course, you've budgeted for three days or three weeks for discovery on site. You go home. Your time is up. Now what? Keep track of the fact that that key stakeholder wasn't around the table? It's an early warning sign. You're building a 
whole big marketing and automation and implementation system that they're going to use. Uh, the marketing specialist, who I think does all the work, isn't there as part of the meeting. So uh, that's what I'm asking. Does all the work, gets involved in all the systems. But because at the meeting, someone decided only the top level people, you know, the business manager or the director of the VA is actually signing the contract and negotiating. Never happened? <laughs> yeah, good. Neglecting the content audit, often a part of discovery, often um, bigger than the discovery itself, right? Depending upon the size and scope of the project. Who would ever ignore a content audit? No problem. We know what it can give us and how much trouble it can get us in if we don't pay attention. But. No, you're headed for a pitfall if. <laughs> okay. I thought that this might have ring true to some folks, right? Well, what are you going to do with those PDFs? And how many of them are there? And what, what's in them? And can it be structured? And do you want it to be a web page or do you want it to live forever as a PDF? I'm old school. The saying used to be free the bound periodicals in issues important to you and me. The PDFs. How do they live? Are they going to be searchable? What's going to happen? Who's going to break them down? Who's, who's going to do that work? Oh, just a couple of PDFs turns out to be thousands and thousands of pages. You have a really good one on this. This is like an entire session. Right? <laughs> so feature creep, I think we all have a decent idea of what it is, but I think people Sometimes get it wrong in the sense that they, they think about one particular thing and not another that's more important to them, which is we all we all understand a scope of work, but when a client comes to you and wants additions to that scope of work, and they say, well, well I decided I, I wanted to also add this to that. And you're like, well, we already do that on every one of these pieces. But that's not, to me, the most um, concerning feature for It's the one where you have not This wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. So now you're sitting there negotiating with the client, trying to fix it, trying to get them exactly what they wanted because you just miscommunicated. That's feature creep because you now have to modify whatever, whatever it is you develop. You might have to add additional features to make that thing do something that you did not expect that cost additional hours. And you're going to have to eat all of that because you did not properly communicate with the client and make sure that. And it's another example of feature creep, right? Is when either a member of your own team or the client is excited. This is good. We're all, we love to use Drupal and we love to talk about all the amazing things it can do. I, I was in business for years before I realized that I was responsible for half of the overages, right? <laughs> because I kept talking about how great it would be. So. So the point is, somebody's listening out for this warning 
sign, and when someone's acting, to qualify and ask questions about it. Maybe it's a legitimate feature that needs to be added to the scope or to the backlog, but we never go into it without being very wary of what it can do to our, our, our other items on the scope, our budget, and our timeline. User stories. We can't talk enough about not defining user stories. And this is something where on simple sites, people say, oh, it's a simple site. What do I need a user story for? Well, you need user stories for every level of your project, especially for the folks actually putting the content in. Your user experience always benefits from a clear set of user stories. sign might be, oh, you know, they're just going to have to do that, right? People are going to get enlisted and volunteer for things, but that good-naturedly often or not, right? So, you know, we're going to run through these, and then we want to hear from you, you know, what might be some warning signs that you'd watch out for? What are some experiences that you've encountered? Do you think this early warning system is going to work for you, or would you do something else? Skipping or skipping entirely testing. Everyone have proper QA processes and monitoring. Who here has a, a, a does has got six people on their QA team? How many people have one person on their QA team? Awesome. <laughs> right. How many people the developers the QA lead? Yeah. Honest, honesty, that's what we need, okay? Time, budget, scope pushes us into these conditions. We know it's a problem. We know it's not the best way to do things, okay? But we've got a long-standing client and they need some help. Is it gonna be a case of no good deed goes unpunished? Okay, or are we going to be able to avoid the worst of these problems? So sometimes you can't steer clear of these pitfalls completely, but that's how we have the concept of harm reduction, right? I'll take a broken leg, please. I don't want a broken head. So with QA and testing, you know, when was the last time somebody saw that actually working? And this is a pretty common thing. You know, a lot of us are working in agile environments and we're sprinting and we're iterating. Well, when was the last time that thing that we sprinted on three sprints ago worked? That's why we have... Your latest commit broke XYZ. It was working yesterday. I proved it. Yeah. I proved it and it was working yesterday. Maybe it broke six months ago. This thing integrates with this other thing and it runs a script as I told you. Oh, there was a change order. Oh, did we change the project manager's budget? What percentage of our, our development time is project management? How is it going to change? Is it going to be part of discovery, not part of discovery, PR, part of creative, part of strategy? The code can be rewritten. Lots of code will take more time to rewrite. You're more likely to get, have to rewrite lots of code if you don't have enough project management. So I would argue for one thing, you can't cut. Because it's going to happen anyway. If you get rid of all your project managers, the developers are going to end up doing that. Right? So you're just organizing everything and talking to clients to figure it out, building a client list. Somebody's going to do it. It's got to be done. So is your lead developer going to be your project manager? Hopefully not. <laughs> Chances are, been there, done that. What are you going to do to mitigate the risks, to reduce the harm? What are you going to do to avoid the worst 
of these pitfalls. How many folks have worked uh, or dreamt of working, dream or nightmare uh, of a, with uh, multi-sites, right? What type of experiences have you, have you had? Every, good experiences, so-so experiences, bad experiences. Okay, it's about even, All right? We wanna, we wanna change that ratio, All right? So there has never been a multi-site, both the old kind and the new kind, launched in Drupal that didn't require careful, careful thought. Not every one of those projects got the careful thought it needed. Multi-sites, especially some time ago, were a really appealing option. And they saved a lot of time, they saved a lot of money and some of the complications weren't readily apparent. Now, we have a lot of technology that uh, has come about that makes the old kind of multi-site where we shared a single code base um, uh, only one of the options that we can take if we want to get some efficiencies across many different sites. But those new strategies and new options have a different set of considerations and risks, right? Oh, those great rings, you know? So, you know, like anything else, there's, you know, two sides to, to this. I mean, we were talking about how uh, we had a presentation last year in New Orleans with General Electric and General Electric raved and loved and still raves and loves their multi-site setup that we proudly built for them. A lot of time and effort was put into planning that multi-site and it is a traditional multi-site, right? And, but we've got a lot of other stories out there where people have called us and said, oh, I've got this multi-site, please get me out. Skipping the specialists. How many people have a webmaster on their staff? How many people have advertised for a webmaster recently, hired one? Seen any unicorns walking around? There are. But web ma webmaster, webmeister used to be ubiquitous when the web was a very simple place. It's not a simple place anymore. There are so many different technologies. Now, how often have you worked with organizations that have said, yeah, we're trying to decide whether or not to hire one person who really knows everything or a firm that has lots of different people in it. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. Right? So there's a tendency to really not, not em embrace and understand that everything is a specialty. And yeah, we do have awesome full stack developers. But we need our specialists. Because the world, the, the world, the web, the internet is just too big and too specialized. So warning sign. Why can't David just do it? He's a full stack, awesome Drupal contributor developer. Been at it for many years. Why can't you do everything, David? <laughs> Depends on what else we have you doing. <laughs> so I'm sorry these are a little difficult to read, right? Neglecting to plan for continuous development policies, tools, and workflows. So you just have to build a site, right? That's all you're doing. You're gonna deliver the site and then it's over, right? Not so much. Right?
Warranty period is over. And this is the typical, you know, thing we hear. And it, it happens just as often. We hear it just as often from the client as anybody else, right? And I'm sure clients have heard vendors say it. Um, and if you haven't heard them, they've said it, right? So in all these things, you're listening out and you're asking questions to qualify these things. So if you're in a project and there's a crunch okay and you've got you're sprinting literally to the finish line you still got to have this discussion in order to avoid the worst of your problems you've got to take the time out for the discussion okay build a series of of if then else statements right let this discussion surface those statements. Well, if when we go to launch and we've only got a 24-hour window on a Monday to go live, what are we going to do if this happens? If then else, right? So not an ideal situation. It's easy to give you a list of pitfalls. One of them could be, you know, don't go live on X day. Make sure you're going to have a team who shows showing up to work the day after a go live. Okay. What does that mean? Well, you test most things. So the point, the point being that, you know, harm reduction, you know, if you've got to launch in a week, if you possibly can, you should launch three times before the real actual launch day, All right? And build that into the project plan. So, and finally, not engaging with the awesome Drupal community. So you guys are light years ahead of the curve because you're here uh, and you're talking to, to, to one another. But a lot of folks are not. And, and, you know, you might have some developers that are lone wolves and they're really great and smart and out there and they may not be that comfortable talking on anything other than IRC. But there are some things that need to happen face to face. And... If not at a big con, then at a local meetup. Your clients in particular, all right? And it's to your benefit the more your client knows. So what, what we just take as gospel is that liaising and joining up with the community accelerates everything. It greases everything. Uh, and it really accelerates your, your project toward success uh, in so many different ways. So... Um, And so remember, you're, you're out there and you're sniffing. You're establishing this mentality in your, in your team of an early warning system. And if you find that your client 
um, you know, you've been talking to them for a couple of months now. They should be pretty enthusiastic about learning Drupal and meeting other people in the, in the community because it's part of the value equation. And if you find a couple of months into it that they are not into it, that's an early warning sign. Right? That means they're going to be resistant to understanding certain realities. Um, they're not going to be a partner in, in helping you solve certain issues. So all these things are, should flag um, a call and response inside with your early warning system. All right, let's, let's question what's going on here. Is it people's um, schedules? Uh, do you not have anyone particular on staff that ca can do th that? Is it something I said? Um, and so these are ours. These are what we've identified as some issues for the folks and clients that we work with. This is our response to helping us and we think others avoid some of these pitfalls. You know, what, uh, what do you think that, you know, in your experience has been some common pitfalls are and how we can go about of avoiding them? So um, we're, we're interested in having everybody here hear from as many different uh, people as possible and not just you know, our experience with avoiding these pitfalls. So um, I noticed some heads nodding up and down, down here when we talked about uh, discovery and content audits way back at the beginning of the uh, list. I can pick a pitfall. Feature creep. How many times have folks fallen prey to what David has said by failing to precisely identify a driver or a spec and then finding that you've all had to build it more than once. Yeah? Yeah? No? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you want. I just had a question. I'm oh, sorry. A question about feature creep versus scope creep. Um, in my mind, I was as you were first introducing it, I saw feature creep as more something that's driven by your internal team, your developers saying, oh, look what I can do. I just came back from DrupalCon. I learned about this. Um, is scope creep a different thing? Is that what's being presented by the clients and saying, oh, we forgot to tell you about X, Y, Z? Or in your mind is feature creep everything and are you watching the entire team to try and no, you you mitigate that? No, you really great one. Okay. And, and <laughs> it's really helpful to think of any kind of creep <laughs> as not necessarily a good thing. Uh, might be, might be a benevolent, uh, but so feature creep would be really specific around certain behaviors uh, um, applications inside your web, and they can certainly come from your own development team and the client. Scope creep is very similar, but I think uh, a much broader category where you're um, forgetting or not aware that there are certain major portions of your project that were not adequately planned. Right? And you're realizing that in order to accomplish the things that you nailed down in your scope, you've got to do all these other things first. There are certain larger dependencies. Well, someone's got to pay for that, right? And there might be budget, there might not be budget. Now, sometimes there's a limited amount of funds. Um, folks have to be willing to take things off the table when that happens. So the interplay between scope and features are important because if, if you find that you've missed something in scope that can't be accomplished any other way, you might have to take some features off the table in order to accomplish that. I would, that would be my response. What do you think, David? Oh, that's great. That sounds like a really cool 
actual thing that we want to talk about, not in the scope of backlog. Thing, that goes in the backlog. If it never comes back out of the backlog, then maybe it's not a priority, right? Or maybe it's something that gets added to a future meeting, but maybe depending on the project or what you're doing, there's a need to the work for that, and so it needs to be discussed. But being very clear about the expectations for each individual meeting um, can help you sort of keep that up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, kind of following on with that, I think I would add to your list there, um, one of your, your warnings is not having a clear enough or defined scope because th those are the problems that we, we've seen in the past that you run into where, you know, we talked a lot about a lot of cool ideas. They didn't talk about some things that they actually need but never mentioned. And then we thought, it, you know, of a bunch of things that, you know, maybe that they didn't need but we had it anyway. Um, one of the things we found to control that is that we do at the start of the project write a really like painfully nauseatingly detailed scope. Excellent. I hate doing those, yeah. but it's like eating your vegetables in terms of like health for the bottom line. Those are the most important things because I heard you guys say a couple times, you're going to have to eat that cost. If it's defined in the scope as to what it is we're building in such a way that both the client understands when I click this button, this is what it does and the developer understands we're using the paragraphs module and we're putting this field in there or we're making a custom block that does exactly this with this database field. Like, that sucks to write, mm -hmm. but when it comes down later to negotiate about, well, we thought it would do this, well, before we started, we gave you a whole scope and said what it does. And so it's a lot easier to manage that expectation and have, like you said, that budget conversation about, okay, well, what, what do we we miss this part collectively. It's not just, hey, developer, you missed it. We all missed it together. What are we going to do to still get under budget and still get this done? Knock something else off the back, add more budget, something else. But the answer is not, well, the developer will eat it because it's their fault. Yeah, so. I think that's, that's, well, that's a very real statement. And I would ask, ask you, when, because this came up actually up um, yesterday. We did a full day training on project. <coughs> And Maria is part of our, our team, David and, and, and I. And uh, as we are want to do, do, we added a slide last minute. Maria says, I want to ask a slide. When is done, done? And we said, huh? When is done something really done? And we're like, oh, OK, now we get it. How do you find, define done? So I would say, how do you define you know, your scope? When do you know your scope is done? so adept, not just technically, but at communication and of this process of call and response. And when, when you've got a scope and you think it's done, you have someone on your team that says, hmm, does that mean that we're not going to do this? And somebody's listening for the, for the, for the response. And you're sort of distilling it and zeroing it in on Nail things 
So this morning, I said it then, and I'll say it now, I had the privilege of being up on stage and introducing Dreams, and we talked about three different things, right? We talked about communication, sharing, and leadership. And I think when you're engaging with clients, you know, those three things are really important, right? So we talk about communication all the time. Like David says, what does that mean? Does that mean that your, your partner is volunteering information, that they are sharing willingly and generously with information that they may or may not expect to be helpful, right? But since they don't know your business, they're willingly sharing it because it might be relevant. Right? That is a habit of mind. That is a cultural issue with, with organizations. And that's not always something that is, is present. sharing, communication, like we talked about for our community, right, is extremely important in a relationship between a vendor and, cl and a client as well. Leadership is absolutely good. Because if you can recognize what the client's habit is nervous, that is guilty of a flaw in your mind, then it's going to be good. If, if, you, if your key stakeholders are not engaged in the project, you can expect to be frustrated. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm the one who has to approve everything. Sounds 
show up. Well, we, um, in our project management class, we talk about doing races, clients. Like, okay, who's responsible? Who's accountable? Who needs to be consulted? Who's an influencer? You know, we've sat around meetings before, and you get this really passionate individual around the table, and you realize they've got this great title, they're articulate, but they're an influencer. They're not, a, you know, as they're not, a, they're not an owner of the of the project, right? And there's all sorts of internal struggles, you know, going on that we're not aware of, or somebody's not aware of. So you, so you know, to that end, structure, right, uh, is is a part of that. So un, 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 communication is good, but there's different types of communication, unstructured, structured, and when you get down to that scope. That's a very precise form of structured communication. I'd add to that, Grace, your, uh, you may, your stakeholders may not be the audience or the size. Sometimes they think they are. Uh, say again, your stakeholders? Your stakeholders may seem big. Uh, your stakeholders are not necessarily the audience of the website that you're putting your mind to. Yeah. Even though they don't think that they are. So true. When we get that a lot in not Side and on the no continuity, no consistency, and 
six months, the, client, the vendor has also had a full transition, so the people who were initially doing the discovery and... Um, so were your organization's skills and documentation, all that is so important, right? If someone comes to you and identifies some concern, well, then maybe fix it, right? How about just tell me about it, what do you need to fix it? So we have a record of it, and then what happens when I'm not here? Well, I can, I can just, you know, vacation for three weeks, right? So we have tickets for everything, and someone can go and see the conversation, get an idea of what the problem was, and work on it while I'm away. But what if I leave, or what if the client leaves? And so I have a record of everything. So we have documentation for all these processes, documentation for all the client processes, and generally people listen to those processes, right? So we can onboard people, we can get them used to using the same information they've been using for familiar with the client processes so that when they do, they can't rely on each other to get these things easily onboarded. And it helps you when you have issues around consistency among stakeholders, right? Because the stakeholders, they're not the folks that are filling out the tickets generally, right? And they're the folks that are gonna change direction and make course corrections and the, and the like. And um, they're also the folks that have to come to terms with scope and budget and, and timelines. That's really, really good. And I would add to that, that has a bearing on how we structure our engagements, right? So we try as much as we can to break things up into very logical stages when we work on projects. When you have some long, open-ended <coughs> uh, relationship that's something other than maintenance, okay, it makes it much more difficult to manage change of that nature, I think. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. So this list is not specific to Drupal. Drupal. Correct. Um, what about sharing this, going through this list with the client and just getting this information? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about being transparent, being real. That's great. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, in, internally, I don't know if we've had that uh, di discussion. Uh, certainly everybody. I've been on both sides of this. I've been the client, I've been the yeah, we, do have, we do have other templates and checklists that yeah. we use. So I'll Maybe soften. Thank you all.